Hi yogis. So I'm going to share with you my notes from the discussion yesterday. Got some strange sunlight going on here. Thank you, Mother Nature. Kind of half light, half dark here. Showing my yin and yang sides. So um, yesterday we discussed women in Ashtanga uh, with many practitioners from around the globe, from different ages, different cultures, um, even with different slants on how they see this. Uh, some came from almost shamanic points of view. Others were very high profile yoga practitioners. Others were older, wiser practitioners who have had this practice for decades, almost 40 decades, uh, Kathy Cooper. So lots of wisdom there to be shared. And of course, all their personal experiences, um, not necessarily all the same, but all valid and all useful to hear. So um, here are my notes. Um, so we discussed adjusting the tempo of the practice according to your cycle. So women don't just have a daily cycle of day, night, digest, rest, sleep. Um, we have a monthly cycle. And remember, this isn't just a thing that happens once a month, i.e. period. It's, um, that's just the fruit of the cycle, if you will. Or the end of the cycle, better said. So it's a whole monthly change that we go through, as we know, affecting our hormones, our moods, our energy levels. I myself know there's days where I just want to, or I need to sleep or rest more than usual. There might be days where I'm jittery or nervous or agitated. Uh, there might be days where I'm soaring with energy and I feel like a bird flying through my practice. Um, other days, you know, practice is meditation because that's all that I need or, or feel like. So important to adjust the tempo of your practice and give yourself permission. Um, we discussed restorative practice and how lovely it would be to have an alternative practice in the Mysore room. So I know this happens in a few places, but it's certainly not traditional. Um, we also touched on physical things that happen in your body approaching time of the month and if people choose to practice through that or don't and why um, is it because of tradition or is it because of personal choice so everyone gets affected in different ways you know some people might never have a migraine or back pain sometimes I have a hip pain sometimes I don't so it was interesting to hear that some of these ladies recognize that each cycle is, is different as well. Not all the cycles are the same. So adhering to that in your practice. Giving yourself per uh, permission to do a simple practice without inversions, which is most commonly known. Not to turn the body upside down when something's trying to flow out of it, but um, not to do the practice with bandhas. So I am really keen to talk about that because bandhas, Udhyana Bandha, Mula Bandha, they are in fact squeezing, triggering and holding tension in the area of the vagina and the cervix and the womb. So if you're squeezing and tugging and pulling on those muscles and they're tense or taut, especially if you do this when you're teaching or you know subconsciously in your daily life, they're not going to relax, the blood's not going to flow there. Or accumulate there and I myself have had discussions with other Ashtangis who have gone through phases where their periods have become irregular or small or even non-existent so it's not unheard of to hear of people going through an early menopause as uncomfortable as that sounds but due to too much bundle work so remember in the Hatha Yoga texts they actually praised the inner holding of the the elixir, the liquids of life, which in their case they believe was semen and menstrual fluid. And we know nowadays that it's not necessarily good to hold these things inside the body. So anyway, uh, moving on, uh, we talked about the, uh, the doshas, so pitta, vata and kapha from an Ayurvedic point of view and how these 
come into play at different times of the month and how there's uh, certain behaviors and habits you can adopt to help the natural cycle do what it should be doing, not to resist or to obstruct the natural cycle. Um, and apparently good kapha is needed for a good period from an Ayurvedic perspective. I don't have a lot of kapha, um, so I'm quite a pitta type person. I'm quite hot, uh, just digest quickly. I'm not uh, <laughs> one for sitting still for very long or doing restorative yin practices, so that was a nice point to take home for me. Um, pranayama can be used to refresh the body, so that was a nice, uh, a nice um, way of thinking about pranayama as a way of still getting energized, but in a more static way. Um, so Patabi Joy has always told students who lost their periods to take rest. That's really important. So he did acknowledge the fact that, you know, this was not a good effect of the practice on a female body. It started to disrupt the menstrual cycles. Um, Peg McQueen said um, she was practicing like a man for a long time, trying to be as good as they were and ferocious and vivacious and full on in her practice and only learned to slow down when she actually went through perimenopause. And she actually said, I was practicing like a man and to practice like a woman is beautiful. And she was really happy with her practice right now. Uh, Kathy Cooper said, when you're dynamic, you want to stay dynamic. But if you do that, you burn out. So that kind of applies to me. When I'm dynamic, I feel like I always want to be dynamic in my practice. When I have a good practice, I chase it in other practices. But that's not the way. <laughs> um, side notes here from me, when we were discussing yin and restorative yoga, um, we mostly discuss restorative as the alternative practice. Um, I believe this is because it aids the body in resting, purely resting. It's not about stretching or flexibility, where in fact yin is. Yin manipulates the soft tissues and the muscles and the ligaments and the joints. And this necessarily isn't good. If you're on that part of your cycle, you might actually be naturally more open before your period. As my friend informed me, I think there was a day when I caught my heel in Kapodasana and she said, ah, but look at the time of the month. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so um, bear that in mind if you're choosing yin instead of restorative. Um, I heard the words, I don't want to be choked by a tough physical practice or have pressure from the practice. So we talked about feeling shame or guilt if you don't have the practice that you should have and some of this is due to what we see around us always projecting you know what we want or what we think we should be doing maybe we've seen it in books or beautiful demos on youtube when in fact we all have different body shapes different body proportions different ages different jobs different constitutions different mental tendencies so it's a tough one. I heard a student in class today saying, you know, if we're supposed to adapt the practice, then why is it taught like it is? And it's a tricky one because you do have to learn the framework of the practice before you can then learn what it does and how it does it to be able to play with the controls and adapt it. You also have to learn how your body works and your mind works and understand your goals of why you practice before you can start altering it. So that comes with time and experience. Um, yeah, Peg McQueen also brought up the importance of having strong legs and a strong core and spine as you get older, especially, maybe become more fragile in the bones. So really important that you keep the leg strength as you age in your practice so standing postures are amazing for this maybe they become your only practice and you get all the juice from standing postures um, honor the practice so the practice doesn't take over practice must support life don't sacrifice yourself 
for the altar of the practice. Don't chase energy. Don't chase after it. Breathe, ground, and then you see what the practice is about. So we talked a lot about, someone said, don't sacrifice intuition for the glory of the pose. So we kept coming back all the time through the discussion about the breath. The breath is your practice. The breath is reflecting your inner work, your energetic work, your mindful work. So always this breath, breath, breath. People talked about practicing through menstrual cycles, through pregnancies, through after having children, coming through menopause, aging. And all the time these uh, women said, come back to the breath and the breath will show you what to do. Um, the female body blossoms with age. That's lovely. Um, someone even noted that uh, the body seems to, the female seems to have more wisdom after the menopause. So that was interesting. If you think of olden times where they always respected their elders and the, the eldest woman of the village or the town or the population, the community. Uh, this practice was designed for teenage boys. Um, so I used to have a bit of a problem with that. Maybe I couldn't believe it or thought it can't be right. But it's true, so Krishnamacharya and Patabi Joyce, well, they both came into practice as young boys. <laughs> they experience uh, yoga postures, the learning of them as young boys. And um, Patabi Joyce started when I think when he was 11, and Iyengar about that time. And um, Krishnamacharya at one time was um, hired by the Maharaj of Mysore, and he was teaching young boys in this dynamic way. So to keep the practice interesting, it's a practice of expansion, of dynamism, it's exciting, it's engaging. And boys' bodies are straight and they're light. Not like a woman's body that's built for fertility, it's quite earthy, we're bigger lower down. Boys' bodies and men's bodies, when they develop, are bigger up top, the stronger, generically speaking bigger above, slimmer below. Women's bodies are different. And also women's bodies, I'm glad we spoke about this, are supposed to have more fat. So a body that doesn't have enough fat through perhaps losing fat and body mass through too much practice isn't going to be a healthy body that wants to do its natural cycle and bleed and get pregnant. So that was uh, coming from an Ayurvedic point of view, that one. So a lot of these really advanced female practitioners who are very successful in their yoga posture practice often end up with these, I want to say thinner, but better said slimmer, slim-lined, lean, strong, wiry bodies, much like a young boy. <laughs> um... So we have, I've written here, we have this idea that these lovely curvy female bodies have to be thin or straight. And let the body bloom how the body should bloom and enfold in its wisdom. A fast hard practice aggravates vata. Body without fat again will not get pregnant. Anorexia and bad nutrition sleep digestion, these are all uh, unwanted side effects that might happen if you overexert in the practice. Body shame makes guilt zap the joy of practice. We listen to thoughts instead of intuition based on judgments. Is it useful to stack childbearing hips over shoulders? I've written, so hips are built for stability as is the lumbar, as are the thigh bones. The shoulders are built for flexibility. <laughs> Tiny bones up here. We're never gonna get those bones bigger. We can get them stronger, but the pelvis is always gonna be heavier. Yeah? <laughs> 
Men have bigger shoulders, generically speaking, skinnier hips. We are the opposite way around, and yet we're still doing the same practice, the same jumps, lifts, arm balances. We're still trying to stack the upper body on the uh, the lower body on the upper body, when in fact we have a lot more weight in the lower body. Um, this was nice by Nia Faria. She said. She's proud to do the best practice she can do with what she's got. I thought that was lovely. And again, the knees might not touch the floor in poses, half lotus poses. If you have body fat around your thighs or your bum, we're supposed to have fat. <laughs> Muscle builds differently in a male and female also. And... The shape of the practice always changes, it's about the breath, the essence, not the posture. It can still be about the sequence, it can still be about Tristana, but it's not about looking like someone else. It's about your breath, in your situation, in your body. Practice should not have this linear projection. So this is very male, and actually this came into a, a, a series I watched last night. This. Uh, series I'm watching on Gaia, the recent episode I watched last night was about matriarchal societies. It was actually talking about pre-Adamite societies, so before this um, humanity wave that we're living in now, when actually matriarchs led the, the society. They, they were queens, not kings, and uh, religious leaders that were women, and actually it's proven that there was less uh, strife, and war, and battle, and conflict in the world when women had more power. So that was very a good consequence of uh, watching that program when I watched it last night. So women listen more intu to intuitively and adapt the practice we need each day rather than just going in this straight line, in this sequence, pose, 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 pose. I still have the question, being someone that's been a home practitioner for, for always, how does my circular practice, the one that changes and adapts, but still respects the, the elements of essence of the practice, the psychological effects, the energetic effects, the breath, the bandha, the drishti, the sequence, it still has these elements, but I might not do every pose every day. I might do different variations of poses, or I might miss poses, or I might do half primary, quarter of secondary. I might do a quarter of primary, a lump of secondary, and go back and do hip openers, do my finishing. I might just stay in meditation. So how do I fit, or how would I fit in a Mysore room? <laughs> I still have this question hanging over my head. Maybe I'm not supposed to. Um, So I'll finish by with something Chandana said, which was the uh, intent of the practice. The intention is what's most important. It can be used to fire you up or soften you. And Kari said this as well, that some people are watery. They need a bit of structure. Um, other people are too hard and they need less structure. They need to soften. So... I mean, all these things come with time and experience and wisdom. And I'll finish this by saying, please don't ever try to copy and paste someone's practice into your own. Please don't let that be something from a book or someone somewhere in another part of the world who doesn't live anything like you live. And don't let this idea either come from your head, from your imagination about... Um, you know, how you should be doing this from your own expectations and goals that might not actually be the true intent or intention of why you practice. So the number one for me for sustaining my practice, having it with me has been to understand through loads of contemplation and pauses of the practice why I keep coming back to this practice. Okay, it's quite a long video for me, so I hope that was useful and insightful for you. Remember you are a female, 
If you teach females, females have to bloom. Don't fight nature because you won't win. <laughs>